Cool. So I'm here with Brandon Hall, and I am extremely excited to be here with Brandon. Brandon and I have had a couple of conversations, not about thought leadership, but in the midst of getting to know you. I, it has turned out that you are a, a stellar writer. I've read now mo many of your articles that you have on your websites. And the more we got to talking, the more I felt like, Brandon, you have a lot to share with people in our industry who are trying to carve out a space for themselves to promote what they know and to just really help elevate our field or advance the people that follow them in regards to a specific topic, which really is like at a very high level thought leadership. And you have a, an unbelievable background just in content and also thought leadership. And now you're a gym owner as well, which I'll let you do a, an introduction, but I'm extremely grateful to have you here and that you agreed to do this interview with me. And I'm excited to share what you know about thought leadership and content with anybody who joins us and who watches this. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Um, and, uh, as we were discussing, obviously I think that, you know, quite a bit about this stuff as well. So at any point in our discussion, feel free to chime in with your own perspective. Um, but a little bit on my background, I majored in English, uh, at Lafayette college where I also played football. So it was one double a football came out of, uh, interesting combination. There's not a lot of English major football. No. <laughs> um, and came out of school kind of just looking for a way to put my degree to use, but also stay kind of in the fitness sports performance realm. Um, I loved the weight room when I was in college. We had like weight room captains. I was one of those. It was uh, a place there. I really grew a lot of confidence uh, just as myself and, and just saw how it helped me as an athlete. So opportunity came up to uh, intern with a company called Stack, stack.com, Stack Magazine, which people may be familiar with. Um, based in Cleveland, which is my hometown, took that job on over the course of four to five years, um, kind of climbed the ladder and became the director of content, got the chance to work with so many amazing coaches that people would recognize. I mean, Mike Boyle, Tony Gentilcore, um, Jill Smith, just a, a ton of like so many awesome coaches. Mm -hmm. Eventually was inspired to get my own kind of certification as a um, CSCS, just so I could stay on their same wavelength and also open the door to some coaching. Um, and then from there, uh, my career, I decided to, I had the certification. I was still very passionate about fitness and, and all that, but decided to take an opportunity that came my way that I thought was too good to pass up. It was a VP of content job at a, um, executive search firm that was placing basically uh, C-suite executives and private equity backed companies. And if anyone knows anything about private equity, it's very intense and competitive. So it was like this baptism to the business world for me, which is why I took it on because I, being an English major and having focused on writing a lot and just content, I didn't really understand the business side of things. Um, so that was awesome. Did that for a year. And then about a year ago, I knew that was probably not a lifetime commitment for me, but was just excited. At, Tim Ferriss always talks about like uh, analyzing an opportunity. I'm like, if I say yes to this opportunity, six months from now, if I decide to leave it, well, I'd be happy I did it because of mm. what I learned. And I, that's exactly what I thought when I took that job and left on good terms and everything uh, and felt that way when I did, but knew I wanted to get back into health and fitness and back into... Um, just, you know, coaching really, like really take a foray into coaching. So the last year has been super interesting because I've been using this, these content skills, these thought leadership skills that I developed in full-time roles, both at um, Stack and Falcon. Falcon is the name of the private equity kind of okay. search firm that I worked for. Um, and really consulting with a lot of companies there as, as I've continued that content work. So I worked with the NSCA, um, run gum, proactive sports performance, Hulk fit products, a lot of players kind of in this health and fitness space, yeah. um, to help them create thought leadership content. And 
launched, opened a gym here in, so I was kind of simultaneously coaching and doing content, which I like, cause I feel like it's just two different kind of parts of the brain. Um, but opened a gym about a month ago here in Lakewood, Ohio called decent shape strength and wellness studio. And now it's a unique challenge because I'm still doing my consulting work for, you know, outside clients, but now I'm being tasked with creating thought leadership for myself as a gym owner to, uh, promote my own brand and promote kind of what we've got going on. So it's been fun and I'm, I've learned a lot just in that month because, um, it is, it's a different ball game, uh, compared to working for someone else or working at a company, creating it to creating it for yourself. So hopefully that perspective will, will be useful to, um, the people that we're sharing this insight with. Uh, I'm not even being hopeful. It will be useful. I'm <laughs> sure of it. <laughs> All right. So just to start, I, uh, like you, I straddle both worlds as well. I work in the corporate space, and then I also am in the heavily involved in the fitness space. And thought leadership is something that is no longer even a buzzword in the corporate space. It's been around. People know what it is, but you don't hear it, if ever, in the fitness space, and yet it is happening. So just to get us all on the, the same playing field, can you talk about a, a, what is a simple definition of what thought leadership is? Yes. And I came across a definition I actually like because it's cool. so simple. Um, thought leadership, this is from Western Governors University. I just found an article and I really like the way they put it. Thought leadership is the expression of ideas that demonstrate you have expertise in a particular field area or topic. Mm -hmm. It is that simple. So I think a lot of times people have misconceptions about what thought leadership is because it did originate really in the like business world. And there's kind of, it can have a sense of like, pompousness to it, I guess you could say, like a little, like people are like, oh, you're claiming yourself as a thought yeah. leader. Like it sounds yeah. a little like, who do you think you are? Like Steve Jobs or something. Um, but really, it's really that simple. There are just people out there who um, everyone I think has something that they know more about than the average person. They, they, they are thinking um, on an advanced level compared to the average person on a certain topic. Um, it could be communication for fitness professionals. It could be home appliance repair. It could be gardening. It could literally be any topic is, is ripe for thought leadership. Um, there's a book, a really good book that's kind of tied into content marketing and thought leadership called They Ask You Answer. The author of the book was the owner of a, um, a swimming pool installation company that was go, about to go under. It was like during the recession, 2008, 2009, around there and started just writing about questions that he was getting from customers or just like things that he thought people interested in maybe buying a swimming pool or needing a swimming pool to be installed um, would need like that knowledge and that insight mm -hmm. when they're going and Googling these questions or looking for information. And it totally transformed his business. He's, they're now like a franchise with like 20 locations. Really? Yeah. So, and the guy runs a content marketing institute, but it just goes to show that he applied this idea, this concept of thought leadership to swimming pools. And yeah. it was successful because he was tenacious and he understood the, the core concepts of kind of the question that the um, audience is asking, you are going to answer that question. Um, and obviously there's some times where they don't even know the right question to ask, but you're going to educate yeah. them on areas that might extend beyond that. So right. I think that is, that's how I would approach the, the core definition of thought leadership. I like that. And I, when I hear you talk about that definition, the first thing that comes to my head is, well, there's two parts of that that stand out to me. The one is really that it's, it's a singular focus area. And the second question that comes to mind is, who determines who are thought leaders? Is it a person themselves or is it a title or a label given to somebody by the people that they serve with the information that they provide? So I, the first part is about, why don't you talk a little bit about, it is about having a focused area of quote unquote expertise, correct? For sure. Okay. Yes, and so you would say that that would fall under what you would naturally be drawn to or interested in. Yeah. Naturally, like, what are you, what do you feel like you qualify to be a thought leader on essentially? And we'll talk about like, in, like, um, 
just people feeling like they have imposter syndrome a little bit yeah. later when we talk about okay. who, who's qualified, because I think many more people are qualified than they think. Um, but you know, it's what does your what is your skill set and your experience and possibly your certifications, what do they apply to that you can go ahead and educate others about? So it is, it's definitely more than a passing interest. And thought leadership is always adding value for people. That's another way I think about it. It's not pure comedy, parody, entertainment. It's not like mindless. It's it's something where if the audience is engaging with it, they want to leave feeling like they know more about something, like they can be better at something, do something um, at a higher level. And going back to the question of what qualifies as a thought leader, I think it's such a slippery slope that I, I would just recommend focusing on like the action of creating thought leadership content. So if you are creating thought leadership content, I think you're a thought leader because you are, you probably know more than, I mean, you're going to have your outlier cases, but we're not, we're not going to focus yeah, on no. like actual imposters who are trying to scam people. Um, Cause I think anyone seeking out information like this is self-aware enough to uh, be interested in just self-development, self-improvement. They're not trying to actively scam people. They have people's best interests in mind. I think that just the act of creating thought leadership qualifies you as a thought leader. Now, some are, there are thought leaders who are more, um, renowned or more well-known than others. But I think once you get into the idea of, you know, follower counts or page yeah. views or anything qualifying you as a thought leader, um, that's where it gets a little slippery. So I think really anyone can be a thought leader on any topic. And the, the most important differentiator is, are you going to that extra step of expressing your ideas uh, in a format that's other than maybe just you talking directly to clients or just the dialogue that you have in your head? Yeah. So you're saying, you're saying putting it out there where more people are exposed to it with the purpose of being in service to those mm -hmm. that need the information that you're giving. Yeah. A hundred percent. Just being brave enough to do it and like put it out there, I think is qualifying you as a thought leader, because even though there is so much content being created, if you think about the number of you know, fitness professionals who are actually actively creating thought leadership content, I still think it's very, very, a very, very small minority of the total pie. Obviously, yeah. we see a lot. So we get this phenomenon where we think everyone is doing it because we're confronted with it on Instagram. But in the grand scheme of things, um, it's really pretty limited. Okay. And well, I'm going to ask a question. You can tell me if you plan to answer it later and we can skip it. But okay. what I wonder then is the what you just said about content being in our face every day, which it is, mm -hmm. is there a difference between content and thought leadership? Is it, is the difference in the purpose behind why it was created? Yeah, I think the difference is that just the, the value add for the reader. So like, I mean, content, I guess that content, like you said, Thought leadership is a term that's really existed in business for a long time, but yeah. a lot of times outside of um, the business world, it is just referred to as content. Yeah. But I could also make the argument that like a stupid 10 minute TikTok of someone dancing with dumbbells is yeah. technically content. It's technically video content and you can get content analytics on the content, but I don't think it qualifies as thought leadership yeah. content. Okay. I think that's an important distinguishing factor because anybody can create content. My six-year-old stepdaughter can create content, but it's more so about what's the purpose behind it. Are you serving a specific group of people? And is the content you're giving them going to help them be better in some way, whether that be feel better about themselves, be better at their jobs, or develop their skills in some way that will serve them? A hundred percent. Okay. So the, to build on that then, what would be the benefits of somebody purposely pursuing thought leadership or putting themselves in a position to create content that would be considered thought leadership? How would that benefit a professional, a fitness professional? Yeah, I think it's just more connections, more opportunities, and um, the potential for more revenue and more lines of income. I mean, as soon as you start putting yourself out there, like if you look at any podcast guests on say like the strength coach podcast for example i they are all creating thought leadership content for the most mm -hmm. part like i mean maybe you have some 
outlier. I can't think of an outlier of someone who could, because if you, if you're not sharing your ideas, then you're not going to get that opportunity. So you have to put yourself out there just to expand your, um, the potential for good luck to happen. Essentially, you have to, I forget what that phrase is, but basically like multiplying your odds for luck. And I think that's what, what thought leadership is really all about is, um, there is like, it's okay to, to think of it that way as how it is going to serve you in addition to serving others. And I don't think it's selfish to think of it that way. I think as long as you do start with that intent of truly serving others and adding value for others, it's okay to see the way that, that it's okay to totally embrace that adding values for others is the first step to creating more value for yourself, creating more opportunities for yourself. And I mean, there are endless ways that it could potentially benefit you. You could sell eBooks, you could monetize a podcast, you could meet all these different people you never thought you would meet before because you're putting your ideas out there. And the ideas may be in your head right now, but if you're not actually sharing them with the world in some sort of tangible way where other people can discover them, interact with them, then the odds you're, you're just, um, you're, you're, you know, your odd for luck are just so low. Unless someone stumbles into the gym and watches you actively coaching someone, you really aren't doing yourself any favors of, of kind of putting yourself out there. Yeah, I think you're spot on about just the fact of creating more opportunity. And I was listening to a podcast yesterday where the interviewer was interviewing a literary agent and they were talking about book proposals and they covered some portion of it in which they started talking about how the literary agent loved his job because it didn't require him to be physically able. As long as his, his mind stayed healthy, he could do it. And when I heard that, I thought about our conversation today because really thought leadership to me is like the ultimate career. And mm -hmm. it's one that you can really do beyond even retirement. If you've established yourself through writing or speaking or sharing ideas throughout your career, at some point, maybe physically, you won't be able to do your job anymore. But if you've still got your brain intact and, and you're thinking clearly thought leadership is something that feels so evergreen in terms of career development. Oh, absolutely. And I think for a long time, it was, um, again, that, that idea of like having a career as a presenter or a lecturer was like very concentrated on the business world. Um, but now we're seeing those opportunities expand well beyond the business world and into health and fitness, of course, which is, which is only growing. And yeah. I think, yeah, there's just no, no replacement for that perspective. That value of thought leadership is always going to be there. Yeah. And I also know just having a lot of connections in the corporate space that a lot of corporate companies now are paying to bring people from the fitness and health spaces into their organizations to work with coach or educate their employees about these things. So they're the, really you can create so many more streams of revenue, passive revenue, even just from the mm -hmm. simple act of getting in the habit of creating thought leadership that if God forbid something were to happen to you where you couldn't do your job anymore, it's something you could fall back on and be okay. Right. And it just, even, it, yeah, even beyond that, it just gives you um, just freedom. Like you, if you wanted to uproot and move somewhere, if something like mm -hmm. whatever, like that just flexibility um, that it provides is, is really valuable. And I've, it's been great for me because I was able to use thought leadership skills to create income that supported me until I was able to open the gym. Without mm -hmm. that, I would not have been able to open this gym because uh, I would not have been able, I would have had to work, f uh, more hours for less pay. And I just wouldn't have been able to accomplish kind of the goals I set out for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you sold me. <laughs> Should we end the interview here? Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. What are some, now, when you start to produce content with the intention of it being thought leadership? And maybe we should define content because that could be thought leadership is not just writing. It, it could be you just putting yourself out there. It could be video. It could be you in person speaking. What are some of the 
for someone who feels like they're net new to thought leadership or even just simply the act of producing content, what are some of the inevitable challenges that people face when, when they start down the path? Yeah, so I think if you are starting from zero on thought leadership, like maybe you have experience and, but you've just really never tried to um, just create those opportunities for yourself and put yourself out there. One of the number one challenges is simply thinking that you don't know enough. So again, coming back to that imposter syndrome, and there's that graph of like the Dunning-Kruger effect, yeah. I believe it's called, where it's like the Mount Stupid. Yeah. And then as you actually learn more and are in the field longer, you take that big dip and then you come back up on the other side and guru. So the mm -hmm. person who's been in for 25, 30, 40 years, um, and has regained that confidence. And it was interesting to see at Stack because I honestly thought a lot of the content we got was from the two ends of the Dunning-Kruger spectrum. Like okay. literally personal trainers who had just trained their first client and were like, yes. oh, I know all this stuff. Like I just got certified, just trained my first client. Um, I, can, I can do this. And then people who had been in it for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I think there's um, just a a, you know, that, that effect where the confidence goes down, because as you get exposed to more ideas, you think, you know, less, I think there's real opportunity for a lot of professionals who have maybe been in it for a few years, who do train clients, who, um, are, are dedicated to making this their career. Maybe they don't have thousands of followers yet, mm -hmm. but I think there's a real opportunity for them to put into, uh, practice some thought leadership creation because they have, the skills, but they just are, are kind of at that interesting part of the slope where they maybe are doubting themselves a little bit. They're comparing themselves to the gurus. Um, but if you sit on the sidelines and just let all these people who, uh, you know, it's their first or second week on the job, create a ton of content, <laughs> yeah. which is where a lot of it comes through. I mean, they, they are going to, that's where the industry is going to head. And, um, it's, it's, so I would say the number one challenge is just having the confidence to put yourself out there and it can be tough, but I think we can talk more about how to address that when we go into okay. solutions, I guess. Um, and then number two, perceived need for polish, um, whether it's written or video, thinking it needs to be like really, really good, really, really polished mm -hmm. three time. Um, I think it's the biggest one time is like you know, courage and time, I think, are like the biggest things for a lot of yeah. people. Maybe once they get the guts up to actually do it, taking the time to do it among everything else that's going on can be really limiting. And then four, um, just, and it maybe it ties into a previous point, but feeling that it's too crowded or that realizing that maybe the return on investment is not going to be immediate and just having to figure out that and just kind of yeah. accepting the fact that, hey, my first article ever may not be a home run. It may take me a while to find the right medium, um, things like that. So I would say those are kind of the, the big challenges when people get started. Um, yeah. And we can go, what do you, what do you think? I'm curious. Okay. To yeah. I, so I'm just going to recap what the four were. And then I want to go back to imposter syndrome. Cause I had a, I was thinking of an, a metaphor for it that I think might help our put it into a perspective that's a little bit simpler. So the sure. four were imposter syndrome or just simply having the courage to, to do something that you're not used to doing, thinking that to produce content or thought leadership, that it has to be highly designed and it has to be edited and have all of these features that people pay lots of money for other people to do for them. Mm -hmm. The time to do it, because it does take time and you have to be consistent. And then the really that feeling that, the threat of competition and that you're going to put all this effort into something that's not really going to pay off because nobody's going to notice you. Mm -hmm. So those are the four. So if I go up to imposter syndrome, I, as you were describing the Mount stupid and that graph, which I should, I'll have to link when I put the recording up of this, right. what I kept thinking about was sports because like you, I played sports all through college as well. And it kind of reminds me of the levels of sports. So freshman, JV, and varsity. What happens is all of these teams, 
they have their varsity team, which would be the people that have been in our field for 30 plus years. They are truly probably experts in what they're doing. They're producing content and they are considered thought leaders already. Then you have the freshmen on the one end who are, you know, they're feeling overly confident. They feel pretty good about themselves and they want to be the, the big shot. The people in the middle though are really the most important because those are the group of people that the varsity team is going to pull from next year mm -hmm. to become those people. Like all the people that fall in the middle of that spectrum, which are the majority of us, if we don't start putting ourselves out there and putting our ideas out there, we are really making it very easy for the, the next wave of experts or thought leaders to really self-select instead of the field selecting who they think is best for that job. Like if, if the varsity team only has five people to choose from on JV to make up the varsity team next year, that's, that's pretty easy. But really, and that's my purpose in doing all this communication and presentation skills development stuff is to help develop those people in the middle. Because I want to see a, a, the new round of thought leaders be broader, mo more diverse people that wouldn't traditionally see themselves in that role. Yes. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think that's, that's just such an awesome way to, to think about it. Um, because I think you just have to realize that there's never going to be a perfect time. You're not going to wake up all of a sudden and be like, okay, now I, I own five facilities. I've trained a hundred <laughs> pros. So now I'll do thought leadership. Yeah. It's like there will never be a perfect time to start. And today is as good as any. Yeah, and I would have to say too, if you talk to anybody, and you know better than I do, anybody on that side of the spectrum that's already a thought leader, they would tell you that they're there because they started becoming a thought leader a long time ago, and they put themselves out there. They, they are there because they, they overcame the doubt. I, I really believe that. I honestly think that a lot of, you know, you have your out, you have your mouth stupid people who think yeah. they know everything, but I think there are a lot of people who, um, especially the ones who've gone on to become like bona fide, really respected people in the industry. They, when they were sh first sharing their ideas, they, they, they had doubts for sure. And it was interesting at stack too, cause I would see, um, people writing early articles, maybe it was the first, second year, third year, like, or maybe they had been in for a while, but hadn't really been writing for a while. Um, and just seeing them start to throw ideas out. I remember writing, editing first articles for some people who now I go on Instagram or I go on Twitter or they're, you know, writing for bigger websites and, and they have lots of followers. And I, I truly remember um, just like them starting out. So it is, like that, that whole purpose of just that whole idea of if you don't start, it's not going to happen is a hundred percent true. And it's, I'm, I'm sure if you ask anyone, if you ask Mike, if you ask um, any of these other kind of thought leaders in the space, they will be upfront that they were sharing ideas when they maybe felt that they weren't a hundred percent ready to share ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. Very cool. Okay, so we covered the challenges. Let's see. Polish. Polish is one I can relate to. That was the second challenge you talked about. Because when I go on, let's say Instagram as an example, most of the content that I'm looking at is highly polished. And I use Canva, the paid version, but I do all my own stuff. I'm not a graphic design person. I've probably gotten better over time. It's, it's not great. But I know how much of a barrier that is because you see what's out there. But the, con the thing that I constantly remind myself of is I look at, say, as an example, Adam Grant. He doesn't even design any of his stuff, and yet he has an enormous amount of followers. And it's because really what people value in the end is not how it looks. It's really what's on the inside. And if they feel like you've given them something that they can use, and it's just like, a gym. You could build a really nice gym and have all the state-of-the-art equipment, but if you walk in, people are really unfriendly and the training sucks. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good it looks. Mm -hmm. I think the same goes for content. That's a big one, the polish. Too. And yeah, I mean, if you just like the Instagram example, there are um, 
there are accounts on Instagram where it's literally just screenshots of people's tweets. Like yeah, that's all that. their, their entire Instagram account will be. These are my tweets. So they're not polished. They're just sharing their thought leadership in another way. And they have a lot of good, good following. So, mm-hmm. and I mean, some people just do, some people almost have gone the anti way of just white text on black background to kind of stand yeah. out. And you <laughs> yeah, see that, isn't that too. funny? Like, I really actually think, I think there, there was a point, um, and it was maybe, maybe 10 years ago or so when like the barrier to content creation was a little bit higher and like some of these social media platforms weren't as big where people really felt they needed to have a lot of polish in what was mm-hmm. being put out there. Um, but the, I, you're seeing both sides of the spectrum win nowadays where there's some people who take like invest a ton of money in making it look really good and flashy, but then you're seeing just as many people have success where it is totally no frills and just all about the actual substance that they're providing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's such a, it's a really interesting point because you're right. When, when Instagram was in the first few years, it really was about looking the best because Instagram Mm -hmm. in itself was the visual, the only like visual platform, whereas everything else was more text heavy. But yeah, that's interesting. Now, not so much. You're right. Now it's like, let me do the bare minimum. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And the bare minimum is great. I mean, the bare minimum, the bare minimum is so much better than nothing. So yeah, much it is. And I think a lot of people, specifically on Instagram, I think a lot of people read captions more than they used to. I see a lot of people writing short articles or essays in captions, and I think it works pretty well. I, yeah, I just did one earlier. I'm starting to do that more with the gym. Um, and, it, and it does seem to uh, be working because I think people used to just not even give it a second thought. No. They didn't. It was just all about the picture. Okay. So we named the four things and yeah. Would you have any specific like practical advice related to any of those things to help overcome them so that someone can start to produce some of the content that they want to produce? Yes. And we, uh, I know we just talked about it a little bit. And I have anything to add. No, I have some. Sorry. Yeah, take your, no, don't be sorry. Right take your time. Notes. You came prepared. That is nothing you should apologize for, prepared. Brandon. Um, hmm. I told you. I thought. I think I printed out too many notes. Oh, wait a second. Video clip one, number two. Oh, okay. So here we go. Okay. Thinking you don't know enough. Um, and this is something that I think I'm going to start doing. And I think a lot of people um, have success with it. They just, just look at your programming. Like if you are actually training clients, look at what you're doing, literally just start with the, you can go to the workouts that you have written for that week. Look at a couple movements in there. Look at one movement. What about that movement? Do you think you coach better than the average person? What are the cues, the little tweaks, the 10 to 20% that is going to help someone take them to the next level? It could be just the just a tiny little adjustment that helps someone get more out of the exercise um, or out of the drill or the stretch or the movement. And honestly, that content uh, does really well because I think there's it's you know it, it would be hard to write a two thousand word long form <laughs> article about that, but you can easily write uh, a short article. You can write a social post. You can write a tweet about it. Tweet threads are now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have not done a lot of tweet threads. I'll be honest, but threads are like blow like every yeah. time I go on Twitter, everyone is writing threads now. So that long form is, is coming over to Twitter as well, along with the Instagram mega captions, which is yeah. interesting. Because it that is what like, they call them mega captions. I that's what I call them. Okay, but it's I'm interesting because I feel like it's more like genuine thought leadership on these platforms. Mm-hmm. Um and people are eager to kind of share more nuance to it or, or just you know, draw dots between different ideas or extend ideas. So I would just, that's, that's what I would recommend. Start with what, you know, start with, um, just like the, the, the ways you add value for people every single day. Now, if you want to go and do a whole diatribe on like squatting and like, just like everything it takes to be a good at squatting, you can, that's going to take you a really long time. There is a lot of competition for it. Um, and I'm not saying if, if it's your passion, go for it. But I think it's just a lot easier to kind of focus on like, okay, this person's like what my client's coming in today. Here's some movements I'm going to run them through. Here's why I think I coach them better than the average person. And now I'm going to talk about why, 
you don't have to say why I think I coach it better yeah. than all of you guys, but you can just say, um, you can just focus on, on kind of the value you're adding. So that is what I would say in terms of feeling like you may not know enough. And once you get the ball rolling on thought leadership content and just content creation, it's kind of a snowball of ideas. I find once you gain the confidence, like those easy wins, I would call those easy wins, just looking mm -hmm. at exercises you're already programming, you're very familiar with, you're very confident in how you coach them. Those are easy wins. Once you start creating content about those, uh, other ideas will naturally come up. Um, and you'll just find you're, you're gaining confidence and a willingness to put yourself out there yeah. from there. Cause it doesn't need to be exhaustive. That's the other. No. Thing. And you don't want think, it to be, you won't you do not want, you don't <laughs> it's want like it doing be. a crash diet. If you do that. Yeah. You don't want it to be exhaustive. Even if you get that one article up, odds are you're going to be burnt out and you're not yeah. going to get another one for like six months. And consistency is an important part of thought leadership for sure. Um, do you have anything to add? Well, I think we've talked a little bit about that first point, but is there anything else you want to add? No, I think I like that idea. I mean, I've never said that idea explicitly the way thinking about the, the guy you referenced, the pool guy who answered yeah. questions. So for me, friend, my husband, Brendan and I own a gym, so I coach too, but most of the content I focus on is communication and speaking. So what I do is when I'm coaching people, questions naturally come up and I simply produce content based on questions I'm answering. And those questions happen every day. So it makes content really, really simple. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. And usually I start with a tweet because I know that a tweet will make sure that I get to my point really fast. And if I can put it in a tweet, then I can take it to Instagram and kind of build on it. But I like to start on Twitter and I do that same approach with, I take something that's already existing in my life that I'm already talking about. And then I just put it on social media. Yeah, I love it. And I think it's, it's the best way to do it. And I mean, yeah, if you're not actively coaching people, it's going to be in, in some form or another or interact, at least interacting with people about this um, area of expertise that you have. It's going to be really hard for you to create thought leadership content as it should be because you're probably not qualified to do it. Right. You know, the, the guru, the retired gurus aside who've done it for 40 years. So they have the base of experience to draw on. Um, but the everyday life I find is the, the easiest way to get inspired and feel like you do know enough to get the ball rolling with content creation. Yeah. To Love your idea. Thanks for sharing that one. That's good. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, again, none of these are revolutionary, but I just think they help get the ball rolling for yeah. people. So you're following your own advice is what you're saying. Yes. To yeah. perceive, I am actually, I'll get <laughs> to perceive need for polish. Um, uh, let, I'm just going to go into articles, like okay. literally my process that I use that people may find helpful. Cool. And then okay. when I was director of content at Stack, uh, my job was trainers, coaches would submit their first draft and I would work with them to reiterate, to iterate it and get it to a final draft state. So I feel like I do have some experience in kind of where people may go astray a little bit. Okay. Um, number one problem is most people are just way too wordy when they write. Um, I struggle with it. I'm way too wordy when I talk sometimes. <laughs> but the they're just not concise enough. So the easiest way to do this, and I learned this by writing for the Stack Magazine, where you would literally, it would be like, we have 600 words for this column. Your article right now is 1,100 words. How are okay. you going to get this from 1,100 to 600 without losing the, the value of what mm -hmm. you have in there? Um, the easiest thing to do, and I did this when I was an intern at Stack, is get basically a list of like overused phrases or words. So the one that I kind of called out is there's one from the Content Marketing Institute called get rid of these 25 phrases and words from your content. And it's just a list of like stuff that makes your writing less concise. Certain words, um, certain phrases that are very, very common, especially among beginner early writers. And what I would do is I would get done with my first draft I would use the uh, command F function on my keyboard. I would type in every single one of those 25 and just ruthlessly eliminate or just yeah. adjust as much as possible. Keep that 
near you, where you do your writing. If you do your writing in a certain place, literally print that out. So it's always there. You don't have to worry about pulling it up or bookmarking or anything. I like, I always liked having a physical copy. And then what you can also do is as you write, you're just going to learn a little bit more about yourself. You're going to learn more about your style and you can add to that list by hand. Maybe you confuse, uh, you're and you're a lot. You're, mm -hmm. you're and you are yeah, like, yeah. Action, a lot um, or something like that. You just add that to the list, add it in pen, pencil at the bottom. And it's just another step for you to go through as you kind of look to, to contract things down. I think once you get in the mindset of eliminating and making things more concise with that kind of guideline, um, it's just it, it, it it's really becomes a habit and you'll notice yourself needing it less and less over time but yeah. especially early on i think it's a great thing to do yeah uh, and just to make that yeah. even more specific so i i taught a writing pro one of the programs i teach is a writing program to corporate professionals and i have a section in there about wasted words and the one so personally the one that i always find in my writing that i can cut out in almost every scenario is the word that Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. And I see that in a lot of other people's writing as well. So just to give an example, so what Brandon is saying is there are words that a lot of people use just as a, the, it's almost like, a, it's almost like filler words when we're speaking mm -hmm. that don't, if you read your sentence out loud without those specific words and your sentence still makes sense, you can get rid of that word and it saves you words. So it's shorter and it's easier for people to read. Great. I love that tip, Brandon. Thanks for that one. What's your next one? No, and I appreciate that context for just because yes, it is. It's very actionable. Once you have the mm -hmm. list, it's super easy to follow through on. Um, so tip number two, this is something I do. I, and I think most people probably write first draft on computer or some people might write on their phone. Um, I mean, I, when I'm doing longer writing, I'm obviously, I like to use my laptop when I'm doing Instagram captions or whatever. Typically, I may not do that because those are a little bit shorter. But if you're thinking more like long form kind of article type writing, something you might post on your website, um, I like to create it a Word document, get that all down, and then I print it out and edit by hand. And it's crazy with like a pen in my hand. It is crazy how different um, the same document can read on physical paper compared to a screen and how you're writing. You'll notice things, uh, in your writing, writing, editing on paper with a pen in your hand that you won't notice when you're editing on a screen. I don't know what the phenomenon is behind it, but, um, it's a, it's really, it's something I do pretty much for every kind of longer form article that I okay. work on any, anything above like 500 words. I pretty much okay. go through that process. And then you just implement the edits back to the digital version. And then if you feel like you need to do it again, obviously you can. Obviously we're talking, th these are more like article focused yeah. things for Polish yeah. because, you know, some of those, some of those shorter, um, shorter like captions and stuff like that definitely look to eliminate filler words, but you probably don't need to print out your 50 word Instagram right. <laughs> caption. Right. Um, no, right. I like then, that tip. I'm going to do that. Find an opportunity just to inject your personality. So that was one thing I really um, tried to encourage when I was at Stack working with writers is like a lot of times people are, they feel this need to have this professional tone because mm -hmm. um, they have the idea of what a writer is in their head mm -hmm. where it's like this very professional thing. Um, and just getting people to even include like one anecdote from their, their experience, one, um, I mean, it could even be like, I don't know, a hobby they like that somehow generally, generally relates or just makes the article more entertaining. Tony Gentlecore is really good about this. Like if you've ever read his articles, uh -huh. he gives yeah. you a lot of good information, but he's also just like, you know, his hobbies and what he likes and he makes yeah. it entertaining or he'll bring up yeah. like, a, like an anecdote that he had that he experienced with a client. So just look for those opportunities to come off as a real person and a, a real coach and not just, um, just a, a, a kind of, you know, this generic, yeah. version, this generic idea of a writer that you have in your head, because if you try and be the generic writer, you are going to be the generic writer and people don't like actually reading the generic writer. They like reading real humans. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, that's a huge one. And when I, a lot of people will send me stuff to read through and give feedback on. And the, that's my biggest response is, 
I say, this is, does not sound like you at all. If you and I were having a conversation about this, you wouldn't say any of this, or you wouldn't say it like this. So their personality doesn't come across. And now, and that's exactly what you want. You want your reader to get to know you and your personality, because that's what people fall in love with. But that's what they're attracted to is seeing how you stand out or what your style is different from other people. That's a great tip. Yeah, that's how they, they, you get them to buy in on the value mm-hmm. that you're adding. And mm-hmm. I do find for uh, myself, and I, I think a lot of um, writers, it, unless you've been writing for a really, really long time and you're really, really good at it, it's sometimes easier to go back in and add that personality mm-hmm. rather than just like, I'm going to shoot right from the hip and yeah. this is going to feel 100% authentic. Sometimes it is easier to just get the new generic draft down and then look for opportunities of like, okay, let's, let's bring this up a level. Let's make this more personalized to me and just more feel more like real life. Yeah. Got it. Like that one. I have some video tips. We did. Um, I mean, we shot video at stack quite a bit. This is more, I would say social oriented. Some of the okay. tips I have are, and I'm, I don't know how much video you do. Um, but as I'm doing more video for myself, um, yeah. I'm starting to realize a lot of this stuff. Um, shoot vertically when you can for social media. It, you, that used to be like, again, probably like eight, eight, 10 years ago, a vertical video was like, yeah. or we're like, Ugh, like don't shoot vertically. Now, if you want, especially if you want that um, cross functionality, like of different platforms, like if you're going to post on Instagram, yeah. TikTok, all these different places, it's better to shoot vertically mm-hmm. generally. Um, if you're only going YouTube, you could do horizontal, but generally I like vertical um, you can post it in the stories. You can make reels, all these different types of stuff. Use the front facing camera when you're filming yourself. So you don't waste time. I'm like, this is just like, like you may set up your camera, go demo something, try and like explain a move or something, come back, watch the video and half your body was out of frame the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> you used to not want to use the front facing camera on iPhones because it was a lot worse quality mm-hmm. than the back facing camera. Nowadays, I think the front facing camera is really good. I it is have good, a, yeah. If you have a, a, a somewhat recent iPhone, it's plenty good enough to, to film your content with. Um, and then from there, really, I think a lot of people struggle with being like low energy on camera. Something that we would do um, at Stack is literally like go in with a grin. So like you would like pull your face into a grin before yeah. you start talking and you can always edit it out later and it feels uh goofy but it it's like kind of the ridiculousness of it helps always help me get better takes and come off as warmer i think you posted something recently about the perceived yeah. being such yeah. an important thing More and it really you know. is i mean if you yeah if you seem cold and you're delivering this like people aren't going to really want to stick around to hear what you want to say if they don't feel like you're inviting them into the space with you. Yeah, uh, I uh, that one specifically. So that's something that I also talk about a lot in regards to just public speaking or with the corporate people I work with when they're giving presentations or leading meetings. And the way I coach them so I take it to the opposite extreme, kind of like what you're saying about the big grin, but the, what I tell them to do, as I say, I want you to say that same thing again, except this time, I want you to say it in the same way that you read a children's book out loud. (laughs) Because if you want, if you listen to someone read a children's book, everybody is super animated and they know it's an instinctual thing that we do when we interact with children. And now that's not how in the end I'd want them to do it, but I think sometimes people need to feel both ends of the spectrum or feel the extreme so that they can find somewhere in the middle, which ends up being the right place to be. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I like that a lot. Um, and Do you guys see my say, videos now like this? <laughs> I would say on the topic of um, video, download the iMovie app on your phone. I don't know if you use that, but mm-hmm. if you are like truly coming in with no conception of video and how to edit it, the iMovie app is really, really easy on your iPhone. I use it a lot. You're a lot of times when we do intros for videos, if we're not, I still do it a lot when I'm like introing something, I'm making a video for Instagram or whatever. I talk for like 60 additional seconds at the start. And then I like get into the meat of it. So we yeah. want to trim that out or you may have that extra 60 seconds in the middle. 
uh, that's where like an editing app can be really helpful for you to just cut that straight out. Like, look, it's exactly like writing an article, look for the fluff and just try to keep it pretty, pretty, um, pretty tight. So okay. I think it, it, just having an editing app like that is important. Uh, then just multiple takes, like, don't be afraid to just like screw up five times in a row. Don't go turn off the camera, just keep, keep going. And even if you screw up halfway through, um, and like trip over your words, just start again, again, mm -hmm. you can use an editing app, take the, take the good 20% of the first take, the good 20% of the second take and whatever the good, uh, 60% of the fifth take and just mesh those together and it'll be totally fine. Yeah. That's a great point. The, the thing that I tell people too, is if you trip over one word, really people don't care. If you just correct yourself in the moment really quick and you keep going, people don't even notice. Nobody cares. So, and when I film videos, which I haven't done in a long time, actually, but when I film videos, I trip over words in the middle all the time. And it's really about telling yourself, this is not a big deal. I'm just going to correct my word really quick. So they know what I meant to say, and I'm going to continue on. Yeah. Because sometimes you don't have time to do 20 takes. And I think people sometimes do too many takes because they think it has to be absolutely perfect, which is not true. No, not true at all. And mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes I'll pronounce a word funny or something like that, but mm -hmm. truly no one cares. Like no. they, they, everyone's life, they have more going on than to, to truly care about you stumbling over one word in your video. Yeah. And they're um, like, oh, they're human. I like them better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't come off like a robot. Um, making content creation more efficient. I know we're kind of getting towards the end here, but I do think that um, like just the time. So like committing to the, the time aspect of this and how can you make um, content creation and thought leadership creation just not as time intensive? Because I think what a lot of people do is it's very disorganized. Um, it's just scattershot. Like I'll do a couple days in a row. Then I won't do a couple of days. I've totally fallen prey to that. Um, I can't say I, I haven't and that, but really working with other brands always helped keep me accountable because mm -hmm. I had deadlines. Now I have my own deadlines so I can share some, some stuff I'm doing to kind of help me. Um, you can share some stuff that you've done. That's helping okay. you. One of the th the things that I do, um, make it easy to get your crappy first draft down on paper. Like I think uh, there's a book called Bird by Bird, uh, oh, which is really good writing. Book. Yeah, yeah. Bird by Bird and On Writing Well, I would say are two really good writing books for people who want to get better at writing quickly. Um, and something I've done before to get my crappy first draft down on paper when I don't feel like sitting at a keyboard is I'll use the voice memo tool on my iPhone, just talk into my iPhone like stream of consciousness when I worked at um, a different company, I actually used to do this with one of the executives there and we called it brain dumps. I would ask him a couple of questions. He would just go, we would just go, we'd record it. And then we would use an automated transcription service. I like rev.com, their rough draft transcription is 25 cents per minute uh, of audio, which is actually pretty good um, as long as it's not super, super long. And it's called rough draft, but it's the best one I've found. So you can take a five, 10 minute recording voice memo, email it to yourself, upload it to Rev. Now, all of a sudden you have this big stream of consciousness, all these words, you have the raw material of yeah. your crappy first draft. Oh, and it's goodness. so much easier to edit the raw material, chop it down than it is to create the raw material. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I've actually done writing wise a couple of times, which I really like. Uh, I have a question on that for you. Yeah. Go. Do you find that that would be, so for someone who said, who doesn't feel confident in their writing skills, but if you talk to them about a topic, they know they speak on it really well and with ease. Do you find that that's a, a good option for someone like that? Because then their words are on paper and their words sound like them and the editing process is probably more natural for them. Yeah, I think so. And if you can even find, like, say you have um, a coworker or an intern or something like that, and like ask them, say, hey, this is the this is how I would do this brain the brain dumps with this executive. I would um, we'd settle on a topic ahead of time, something that I knew they knew way more about me because I was new to the world, um, and I'd come with some questions, some semblance of like an outline of what we wanted to talk about, and 
they just let them talk. I would try and ask thoughtful follow-up questions, things like that. So if you can somehow find, they don't have to necessarily be an interviewer, but mm-hmm. someone to just like be your sounding board and ask follow-ups and like ensure that what you're saying they can understand, that can be super, super, super valuable. Um, and obviously it's just depends on your situation and how you might want to make that work. But I think a coworker is always an easy option. If you're working with other people, just say, Hey, let's get this down. And that is how we would create a lot of content. And we would even use Q and a format to keep it Mm -hmm. even easier. Mm -hmm. So I would just take literally, and here's the trick. You don't always have to write the exact question. You don't have to write the question the exact same way you asked it. Their answer can be 20% of the hundred percent that they gave you. Um, and that content did really well for us because it was very, very personable, very, um, and just very efficient. We were able to create it week after week after week. That's a really, that's really cool. I've never heard of that. And I don't think I ever would have gotten to a place where I would have thought of that. I'm going to do that. And I'm going like to be very appreciative of you <laughs> for that idea. I, yeah, I want to hire someone who just like knows, like, a good amount about fitness enough yeah. to like kind of like talk with me about it even if I you know maybe they're not um haven't been in the industry quite as long or whatever but at least like somewhat educated on it just to have these conversations because I do think it's it's very beneficial and it's so much easier to share ideas that way sometimes than writing um okay. one other thing that I'm going to do I know human beings keep me accountable like not letting another person down So I, um, to create content instead of just, cause you know, opened a month ago, have just been doing videos intermittently. Um, I'm actually going to have a friend come over next week. He does, um, like video production, but you really don't need anyone doing video production. I'm going to pay my friend, um, to help, to help keep me accountable, but he's going to come, we're going to film for two to three hours. And out of that, we're going to hopefully produce, you know, 20, 30, 40 videos and just the accountability of me knowing I have that meeting with another. And maybe this only applies to me because I'm a one man operation, but I'm sure a lot of people understand what I mean, where I think trainers and coaches were were driven by not letting human other people down. We want to like, you know, make them feel good. We want to deliver on our promise. So um, I'm excited about that because I already know I'm going to just, I know the type of person I am. If I didn't have that meeting set with them, I wouldn't come up. I wouldn't get 40 yeah. videos done, but yeah. I know yeah. I'm going to come with 40 video ideas. I'm going to start with my current programming. Like I talked about earlier, pick some moves out from there, do some additional stuff. Um, and I think it's just going to be a really good way to like, for me, it's well worth the money that I'm spending yeah. just yeah. to have that accountability. You could do an accountability zoom group with other trainers on content creation, thought leadership. I haven't really heard of anything like that. I think that would be cool to like kind of share how many articles or videos or posts or whatever you want to make over the week, come back and oh, everyone like has to kind of check in and be like, I did it. Because it's, it's, it's like meditation. It's, it seems easy. It's so simple that it almost makes it hard to start because you always think you can just do it the next day. Yeah, you're right. Wow. Brandon, maybe we should start that group. <laughs> I, I, would, <laughs> I would. I think I could use it. <laughs> It'll be the next huge subscription service in the fitness mm-hmm. industry, this accountability group. Wow. These are really great ideas. I mean, selfishly, I'm, I'm very grateful for all of these ideas because I'm going to use quite a few of them. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you. Hopefully, hopefully. And, and uh, just POSE, I forget who came up with that. Post once, share everywhere. That's really easy. Ooh, I like okay. that. Yeah. If you write, um, I did not come up with that, but that's something I try and do. If I, if I post once, I try and um, post it across multiple platforms yeah. where I can and I mean, really works for anything because you just never know who's who's on one platform and isn't on the other. Again, increasing your kind of opportunity luck. Who is going to come across that piece of content that might otherwise not have had the chance? Yeah. Wow. This has been uh, an hour just full of knowledge bombs. I love it. I have a I have a question that's unplanned for you. Mm-hmm. So I've read a, quite a few of what you've written just because you shared your websites, but I'm curious, what of all the writing that you do, you've done, is there one piece of writing that you're most proud of? Um, that is a good question. 
I have a lot of pieces I'm actually really, really proud of. Um, some of the pieces I'm most proud of are we did a path to the pro series at Stack which was like profiles. So it was kind of, a lot of them were published on web, but we would go and interview NFL prospects as they were preparing for the draft and almost do like just their entire background. So like their childhood up through high oh, school, cool. up into college to like where they are now. So it was a type of profile writing that was like very much emotional and, and different for me. Um, and then one article that I've always, um, will be excited about is I remember I was interviewing Christian McCaffrey for, it was a brand, it was like a protein okay. powder. Um, and normally those conversations are very by the book, but mm -hmm. this is another thing. I mean, if you, if you ever find yourself interviewing someone for whatever reason, this could be a good tip. You don't need to stick to your questions. Cause I had, cause a lot of times these branded interviews are one sentence answer, two sentence answer. So if you don't have your questions lined up, then you're not going to, you line up a lot of questions just to anticipate that because mm -hmm. they're probably doing six interviews that day. He mentioned something about training like a track athlete that off season when I just I asked an initial question about um, his training routine and I just totally abandoned the rest of the script and continued to pull on that thread. And it just came, it, it was really cool because around that time, Tony Holler's stuff was like gaining traction. Mike Boyle was talking about how they were using more time sprints, stuff like that. Um, reached out to his coach, Brian Kula, who had coached him, I believe, in high school and is like his personal trainer, McCaffrey's personal trainer that he works with as well, um, got him to add some insight for the article. And it ended up being a really popular piece that I think just kind of added a lot of legitimacy to the importance of speed training and like, gen like genuine sprinting uh, for football sports performance, which is kind of a changing of the mindset uh, for a lot of football players who came up playing in years past, we ran a lot of gassers. We didn't run a lot of like full, yeah. uh, full, full energy system sprints where we we're going in with a full tank of gas. So that's always one piece that I'm, I'm proud of. Okay. I'll have to go. Is that on your website? That is probably on my website. So if anyone wants I'm to check go look out, for it. Yeah, I'm so going to read it. I do have two different um, websites for kind of my thought leadership uh, content consulting, there's decentshape.myportfolio.com, which is just kind of a collection of my health and fitness work. Um, you can see some of the clients that I've worked with there, some article samples, um, have worked with both, you know, athletic facilities as well as like DTC brands, just kind of in the health and fitness space. And then there is thoughtleadcreate.com, which is more, um, executive consulting, management consulting, that type of thing. Very cool. So question for you, do you, so you have your own gym and I know that you're, you're, you're a one man band and you are quite busy. Do you do outside work or do you work with fitness professionals at all? If they were to want to work with you in some way, or are you focusing on your gym right now? So the focus is definitely first and foremost on the gym, just to ensure like great experience for everyone who steps foot in there, but I'm always open to interesting opportunities. I mean, if anyone wants to reach out or ask questions or anything like that, I'm certainly open to, to hearing from you and hearing any ideas you might have, um, hearing about maybe potentially joining our uh, Zoom accountability creation group. For I, know. Content there's, creation I group. think there's multiple I actually think that, ideas. That is, that is a this. good idea because it's so tangible too. Like I think with accountability, you need something very tangible, like did you do it? Did you not? Um, so that could be good. Uh, but yeah, just always interested to collaborate with people um, and learn from people, especially too, because I feel even though I'm still early in my career of actually training clients. So I, even though I had this experience at Stack of working with all these trainers, I sometimes feel as though I'm sliding down Mount Stupid right now, <laughs> heading towards the valley of despair. But um, I ha I, I'm just excited to, to learn from anyone. So anyone feel free to reach out with whatever you might want to chat about. Okay, I have one final question. If you, do you read any blogs? And if you do, who, like if you were going to Google and read someone's articles online, who's the one person that you would want to read? And it doesn't have to be even fitness related. That is a good question. 
I, I do really like Tony uh, General Core's articles. I will actually read a lot of Tony's um, because I think he's just a really smart guy. I think he just brings a good perspective to it. He's approachable. He like mm -hmm. knows a lot and has been doing it a long time, but he never comes off as holier than thou. Mm -hmm. um, so I do enjoy a lot of his content. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, other than that, I just, what I like to do, it's not a blog and I can't shout it out to, okay. uh, to like specific people, but longreads.com. I don't know if you've ever gone to long I, I've been on long reads, yeah. Long, long yeah. So um, like, you know, the whole 10 pages a day of a book. Sometimes I just like to read long reads and not read a book, but it's a, it's a cool place to just interact with long form journalism that's free, um, mm -hmm. which is harder to find nowadays because a lot of stuff is behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff on that website is free. Um, outside of health and fitness, that's a place I spend a lot of time just reading. And I do think reading is, is in, in one of the best ways to become a better writer. Absolutely. 100%. Are you reading, yeah, a, book? Are you reading a book right now? I just read uh, Breathe by James Nestor, if Ooh. you have read that one. That was really, really interesting because we kind of are finishing the sessions at uh, Decent Shape, the studio right now, with some breathing exercises. So I have a lot of ideas from that um, mm -hmm. that I'm trying to apply and looking for the next book now, though, because I just finished that kind of earlier this week. What did you, what are you on? What are you reading? Oh, it's it. not here. I just finished reading last night. I finished zero to one by Peter Thiel. Oh, nice. It, it was good. I found it's really specific to technology companies. And so there were definitely some insights in there that I thought about and how it could apply to my own life. But there was a lot that was a little bit over my head too. Yeah. I'm reading uh, the book creating or big magic, which is a bit woo woo, but I love it. What is that about? It's about, I actually, it's, it really kind of goes hand in hand with what we're talking about because essentially it says that every single person who is a human being is creative and to deny your creativity is to deny your humanness. And so you need to allow yourself to be creative. And that goes hand in hand with writing. I think, yeah, I mean, writing is creativity. Yeah. And so true. it's more of like an inspirational type of put yourself out there. Yes. And who gives a shit what anybody thinks about you? Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to yeah. have to check that one out. That might be the next, cool. next read. Yeah, I think I have like a stack of 10 books. I don't get through them very fast, but I chip away. Brandon, I just really enjoy talking to you and I appreciate you taking time. I know it's really late for you. It's like 8.15 now and you had probably had a full day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for just coming prepared and for giving really practical tips, which I know are, it, that's hard to come by. And especially to hear them from somebody who's had so much experience in the trenches of doing this. I'm walking away with a lot. And I already thought I knew quite a bit about this and you've given me at least five new ideas. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I always enjoy chatting with you. Um, I really do. So thanks for just having me on. And I think the big thing like with thought leadership and just content creation in general, just find what works for you. Like what I've shared is just stuff that's worked for me. It may not necessarily work for you, but once you find what works for you, um, it does become a lot more approachable and it becomes this, this Hercule, Herculean task in our mind becomes a lot more manageable. Well, we'll end it there. That was perfect. Great. Thanks, Brandon. Take care, Jay.